Hey guys, I'm your host, Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to this week's episode of Koobana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. My latest book, Toshiden Theatre, Bite-Sized Japanese Urban Legends Volume 1, is now out. If you've ever wanted a collection of short, bite-sized stories you could zip through whenever you have a few minutes spare, then this is the book for you. Bringing you all sorts of Japanese urban legends you may or may not have heard of before, these creepy, odd and bizarre little tales will keep you entertained and no doubt thinking about them for quite some time to come. Toshiden Theatre is available on Amazon right now, so do check it out and help support the show at the same time. This week, we're looking at stories of cursed items, bizarre events, and vengeful spirits. All things that shouldn't be, and yet, seem to. First up, a student takes the train to school every day, and always sees the same people. Yet for some reason, there's one seat that nobody ever uses, no matter how crowded it is. Why? Find out in... Empty Seat. Just recently I had my first scary experience, so this is my first post here. I take the train to school every day, and I always sit in a particular train car because it's the easiest for my transfer. I always get on that same car day after day, and I always see the same people there too. There's the old guy who reads his newspaper, the couple that get on together, the person listening to music so loud it blares out of his headphones. That exhausted guy who probably worked all night. I have no idea who any of these people are, and yet it's like I get a glimpse into their daily lives, and I feel somewhat close to them, you know? So, in the train car I always ride, there's this seat that's always empty. People will hold onto the straps and stand in front of it, but nobody ever sits there. I don't take the train during rush hour, but... Mornings in the city are still pretty busy regardless. And still, despite the fact people could easily sit in that empty spot, for the two years I took that train, nobody ever has. Of course, I've never sat there either. So, it's been three years now since I started using that train, and when I got on just the other day, something felt off. Somebody was sitting in that usually empty seat. And it was the old guy I knew who always read the newspaper. I've seen him on the train almost every day for the last three years, and we always got off at the same station as well, so I always felt kind of close to him. And yet, in all that time, I never once saw him sitting in that empty seat, and something about him on this particular day seemed off as well. Nobody else seemed to think much of it, but I couldn't stop wondering why he was sitting there, and found myself constantly glancing at him. His neat suit, his newspaper, the way he occasionally pushed his glasses back up, it was all the same as usual. Other than the fact he was sitting in that seat, nothing had changed. We passed through another one or two stations, and as we approached the one where we got off, my interest in the old man waned. I mean... What was so interesting about him sitting in a usually empty seat, right? Suddenly, I felt really stupid. When the train arrived at the station, I got off. The old man got off as well, just like he always did. The train we were just on started moving, and I made my way over to the queue for the escalator to change trains. But then suddenly, the old man started running past the queue towards the edge of the platform. Huh? I thought, stepping out of the line so I could watch him. Then, he moved as though to dive onto the tracks. You can probably guess what happened after that, so I won't go into details, but considering this was a man I saw almost every single day, it was a rather large shock to me. But here's where the story gets scary, or rather, mysterious. The old man threw his newspaper as he ran. But it wasn't the newspaper from that day. I won't write the date, but it was a newspaper from several years earlier. Why was he reading a newspaper from several years ago? Did that mean the newspaper I always saw him reading wasn't the daily paper? 
Why did he pick that day, of all days, to sit in the usually empty seat? And why did nobody ever sit there to begin with? It might all be nothing more than a coincidence, but for someone like me, who enjoys scary stories, well, just remembering it all still scares me, even now. The boy in this next story is intrigued by the idea that dolls can gain souls, and so decides to try it out for himself. Will he be successful? And should he have tried in the first place? Find out in The Weight of a Soul. When I was in elementary school, our homeroom teacher told us an eyebrow-raising tale about how a body weighs a few dozen grams less after it dies, and that weight is how much a soul weighs. Apparently this was calculated from a real experiment done overseas, but now I wonder why he was telling such a story to elementary school kids. Anyway, after school that day, I was cleaning the classroom when another classmate on cleaning duty with me brought that story up again. Apparently there was some horror show on TV that did a special on a doll whose hair grew, and, in short, they treated it like it was precious and always talked to it. Then its hair started to grow, and that was a sign that it had gained a soul. I wonder if that doll weighed a little more after it gained a soul he suddenly said. He sure did think about some weird stuff, I thought. When he said he wanted to try it out for himself, I thought he was even creepier. Why don't you try it with me, he said. But I was scared of the day it might actually be heavier, so I refused. He then went ahead and started the experiment that night himself. About two months later, when I had mostly forgotten about the doll, that same classmate came up to me before homeroom all excited. Its hair has grown, he said. What the hell is he talking about? I thought, but then I soon remembered all that talk about the doll and once again thought, what the hell is he talking about? Apparently he had been talking to the doll every night and when he went into his grandmother's room the night before, like he always did, he noticed the doll's bob cut was now past its shoulders. Is that so? I said, but I didn't know whether I should believe him. Look, I have something to show you, he said, and dragged me over to his desk. He pulled his bag out and fished around inside before presenting me with a crumpled tissue. I opened it and when I saw what was inside, I jumped and it fell to the ground. It was hair. Short hair. He picked it up and put it back in the tissue. I won't know whether there's a soul inside unless I cut the hair off and then weigh it, he said with a smile. I didn't think hair alone would make that much of a difference to its weight in the first place, but I couldn't say such things when I saw that strange smile on his face. And I weighed it, he said grinning. I didn't want to hear it, so I ran out of the classroom without saying a word. The bell rang shortly thereafter, and nervously I returned to the classroom, but he didn't even look at me. He just sat down in his seat. But that was the last day I ever saw him. The next day he didn't come to school because he was sick, and then about a month later he transferred schools. The third day after he started missing school, I went to visit his house to give him some printouts, seeing as I live nearby, and when I rang the doorbell, it was his mother who answered. She didn't appear to be in a very good mood and kind of brushed me off, but I was curious, so I asked about the doll in the grandmother's room. She frowned. She doesn't live here, and she certainly doesn't have a room here, she replied. Then she closed the door in my face. I still have no idea what happened, but that was the creepiest thing I ever experienced. Two siblings lose their mother when they're just young, 
but the youngest insists she's still around. But is it really the spirit of their mother? Find out in Mother's Here. I have a brother who was much younger than me, and when he was around three years old, our mother passed away. After that, we lived in a house with our father and grandmother, and on the second anniversary after our mother's passing, my younger brother started saying that our mother was in the house. When did you see her? I asked, and he said that she was next to his bed when he woke up during the night, and that she played with him and taught him all sorts of things. I was already in high school by then, so I didn't believe in that sort of stuff. But because my brother was still young, both my father and grandmother said that they were happy she was watching over him. After that, my brother often said our mother was around. Sometimes while we were eating dinner, he would point to nothing at all and say our mother was there, or he'd talk to himself while the room was empty. Even though we were related, I honestly found him kind of creepy. A few months later, I came home one day and found my brother crying. I asked him what was wrong and he said mum had hit him. Apparently he was playing near the stove in the kitchen and she got angry at him. I had no memories of her hitting me while she was still alive, although she did get angry, so I was kind of jealous. My brother and I always took a bath together, so after dinner that night we got into the bath and he was playing with a water gun of some type when he suddenly said, Mum's coming now. I was rather surprised. Coming here? I asked. She said she wants to see you, he replied. I was honestly frightened and about to suggest we finish up when he spoke again. She's here. For some reason, he looked up at the ceiling as he said that. I followed his gaze, and there was a grate above us. Even though I was soaking in the tub, I broke out in a cold sweat when I saw it. Something started banging against the grate, and my brother looked like he was about to talk to whatever was up there, so I covered his mouth. He resisted a little, but then he shut up. The banging briefly continued before falling silent, and then a voice came from the grate in the ceiling. It's mum. But that voice was low and entirely unlike our mother's. There was a strange quality to it as well, like it was joking with us. I screamed for our father before I could stop myself, and then footsteps came rushing towards the bathroom. I screamed his name again, and he rushed inside. What's wrong? he asked. At that very same moment, that voice once again came from the grate above us. It's mum. My father froze on the spot. My brother noticed the weird atmosphere and then started crying. Dad picked him up and turned to the voice. No, you're not her, he said. But I am. The voice replied in that same, almost playful tone. No, he said again. This went on a few more times before the voice fell silent. My brother stopped saying our mother was there after that, and he grew up normally, but every time I took a bath, I still feared I'd hear that voice again. There was some talk of seeing a spirit medium too, but... We didn't know anybody like that, so matters ended just like that. A man works doing special cleaning jobs that require a unique expertise, but this next job is certainly one he'll remember. Find out why in Rope. There was a period where I worked as a special cleaner, doing jobs like cleaning apartments where dead bodies were found, disposing of deceased pets, and cleaning so-called garbage apartments. This work involved various tasks, 
and for the residences where a dead body was found, or where the rubbish piled up so much it was nearly impossible to move around inside, the contractors would generally ask us to remove everything, such as all the furniture, because it was no longer usable. As such, these jobs weren't just cleaning apartments, but removing everything inside them as well. According to the contracts the company I worked for had, any items that were found in the house during this removal and cleaning process became the property of the company. So even if we found money, precious metals, etc., we didn't have to give them back. Despite that, the company president was of the opinion that the contractors were already paying us to do a job, so if anything valuable was found, then we should give it back. He tried to instill this ideal in us, but there were still workers who kept things they found for themselves. I once found 2 million yen, and it was incredibly difficult to fight my own greed. I got a call from work on one of my days off, and apparently a body had been found on the second floor of a house, so we had been contracted for special cleaning and removal. I'd been working as both a labourer and a clerk for about two years at that point, so they asked me to take charge of this particular job. After confirming the condition of the site, I realised it would take four people roughly three days. I informed the company as much, and a cleaning date was set. The house belonged to an old man who lived alone. He apparently ended matters because he had no money to live off, and it was difficult for him to ask family for money. I was beyond sad when I heard that, but I was working the job with an elder colleague in his 40s who I knew well, as well as a reliable part-timer who carried out instructions well, so I was able to comfortably create a plan and carry it out. On the first day we entered the apartment, there wasn't much of a bad smell. The sales rep seemed to have left a window open for us when visiting for the estimate. The furniture and other such items were just as I'd heard, and I went straight to the second floor where the body was found. The smell there was certainly worse than outside, but it wasn't bad enough that we couldn't endure it. Looking at the floor, there was a stain right beneath the door that was neither black nor brown, and the top of the door had scuff marks from a rope as well. The doorknob was also bent, and it saddened me to imagine what happened there. He hung himself, huh? One of the other workers said when he came in, and started pulling out his cleaning goods, uttering the words like it was an everyday occurrence for him. The second day went off without a hitch, and while my elder colleague was working to remove the stain from the floor with various chemicals, the others were hard at work moving all the furniture and such into the truck. By the morning of the third day, most of the work was done. The house had a garden with a fence, so we decided to eat out there, and my elder colleague and one of the other workers went to the nearby convenience store to grab some lunch. I drank some tea and chatted with the old part-timer, but about ten minutes later, his face suddenly turned pale and his condition worsened. He broke out in a greasy sweat, and as I patted him on the back a few times, he suddenly threw up and started groaning in pain. Do you want me to take you to the hospital? I asked, but he didn't answer. He just kept groaning in pain, and as I was about to call the ambulance, he started coughing like he was about to throw up again. I slapped him again, in a mild panic. You should throw it up, I said, but when I saw his mouth, my hand stopped in place. Something black was dangling from it. He continued coughing and gagging, and each time he did, it got longer and longer. I soon realised what it was. It was a rope. By the time the whole thing came out, all I could do was stand there and look at it. It was about 50 centimetres long and the end looked frayed, like it had been torn in half. How on earth did that get inside that man's stomach? I had no idea. Are you okay? I asked, 
but he just kept muttering that he didn't know and he was covered in a gross sweat as he lay face down on the ground. My elder colleague arrived shortly after that, so I rushed over and showed him the situation. The very first thing he did was look at the rope, and then he turned to the part-timer. You took something, didn't you? He said. The old man's eyes widened, but he didn't say anything. My elder colleague searched the man's pockets and bags himself, and then he seemed to find what he was looking for in the man's breast pocket. It was something hard, and when he opened it, inside he found several very old 10,000 yen notes, as well as a ring and necklace. This is theft, my elder colleague said, grabbing the part-timer by the front of his shirt. You can leave now, and never come back. He shoved the man's bag towards him, and forced him to go. His face pale, the part-timer grabbed his stuff, and left. Once work was done, and we returned to the office, my elder colleague explained what happened with the things he found in the part-timer's pocket to the company president. He didn't mention the rope, so I didn't either. The president immediately called the customer to inform them of what we had found, and then sent out himself to deliver it. As I looked back over everything that happened, I was suddenly glad I never took that two million yen. A family cleaning their recently deceased grandfather's house finds something interesting hidden in his study. A secret room. And inside that secret room, they find an item he has hidden. Why is it there, and if he went to such lengths to hide it, should they leave it there? Find out in... Sword in the Sealed Room About ten years ago, we found a secret sealed room in my grandfather's house, so this story is about that. When I was in the second grade of high school, my grandfather, who lost my grandmother at an early age and lived all alone in a giant house, finally passed away. He ran an ironworks before the war, and it was the biggest and most famous in town. He was famous around town, and was even awarded the Order of Sacred Treasure by the Emperor. The house he lived in was wooden and rather large, and us grandchildren often went there to play. 49 days after his passing, we all gathered at his house to organise his study. They needed men to help, so I joined them. His bookshelves were crammed full of ironworks books, old technical books, photo albums, and even fishing books. We took them all off the shelves, put them in one spot, and then my aunt started sorting through them. Next, the men, my uncles and I, had to move the large bookshelf outside. It took five of us to move it, and behind it, we found a small sliding door. This door was about one metre wide and one and a half metres tall, but there was no handle anywhere on it. Nobody had heard anything about this secret door, so everyone was whispering and muttering about it. But then one of my uncles suddenly said, Let's open it. Everyone was a little creeped out by it, but this uncle was excited. I wonder if Dad hid any treasure in there. If we find something... Let's send it for appraisal, he said, and then inserted an L-shaped piece of metal to force the door open. Everyone watched with bated breath, and inside there was a single Japanese sword. This sword wasn't just placed there. It sat in a stand made of deer antlers, and before that stood two white sake bottles on top of an old rag, so it looked like the sword had been enshrined in there. There appeared to be three black or mouldy charms attached to the sheath as well, and the room smelt weird and musty. Let's just leave it and close the door, everyone said, but my uncle disagreed. This sword could be a precious treasure, he said excitedly. He picked up the sword and tried to remove it from the sheath, but no matter how hard he pulled, it wouldn't come out. 
Annoyed, he put it back on the deer antler stand. Look, it's covered in charms. We should take it to a temple, one of my aunts said, and everyone agreed. There was a well-known temple the next town over, and so some of my relatives decided to take it there at a later date, and then continued sorting through the study. A few days later, my relatives took it to the temple. I was at school. Apparently, they left the house around lunchtime. It was nice and sunny up until that point, but as they got in the car to head towards the temple, suddenly, it started raining heavily. My school was in a different city, so I didn't see any rain. My father said they arrived at the temple around 12.30, and as they did, something else unfortunate happened. Two employees from my grandfather's ironworks, one of my uncles took it over after his death, died. The ironworks was built before the war, so the building was rather old and not in the best condition. Parts of it were rebuilt and renovated, however, and even in the heavy rains, it never once leaked. But then, all of a sudden, water started seeping in from the heavy rains. There were important, expensive, historical machines in there, so the employees did their best to keep them dry in the absence of the company president, my uncle, and despite the objections of others, two employees said they could climb onto the roof to repair it. The roof was rather high, standing about the same height as a three-story school building. And, just as the other employees feared, the two men slipped and fell. One of them died instantly. It was exactly 12.30. Going back to the temple in the next town, my relatives got out of the car, no idea about what had just happened at the ironworks, and the monk there greeted them with a terrible look on his face. What on earth have you brought here? Give it to me immediately, he screamed. He then snatched the sword from them and ran into the main hall. The family were left standing there, stunned. The monk's wife then took them into a separate room and left them there to wait a while. Eventually, the monk returned and explained about the sword. This sword has great power in it, both good and bad. I don't know how your old man came into its possession, but you should not move it or even go near it. We'll keep watch over it here, he said, and my relatives could do nothing but nod in agreement. They all returned to my grandfather's house, but when they got back, they heard about the accident at the ironworks and there was a big commotion. Nobody ever spoke of seeing the ghosts of those two men at the ironworks after that, but thanks to the recession, it still went out of business two years later anyway. This might be a stretch, but my parents and relatives and I think that maybe that sword had something to do with it. A group of students visit a haunted apartment and get the scare of their lives but it seems their little visit has had much longer lingering effects and is something now after them. Find out in The Last Resident. During the summer holidays of my third year at junior high, I decided to do a test of courage with some of my friends. We decided, very light-heartedly, to visit the remains of an air raid shelter, and ten or so of us ended up going. I'm honestly not sure how many people there were, but around that many. Anyway, I'll mainly tell you about four of them. I'll call them Enko, Okun, Eskun, and the scaredy cat, Keikun. When we got there, it was pretty dark and atmospheric inside, but it was also full of rubbish and the walls covered in graffiti, so it wasn't exactly very scary. It was like, well, what now? And then someone said, hey, I know an apartment nearby where an entire family died. 
And so, we all agreed to go there instead. Shortly before we arrived, we found ourselves on a rather large road with a convenience store, dentist and such. It didn't look scary at all, but we followed the directions and behind that was a road between the buildings, barely big enough to fit one car. Once we passed through that, there was suddenly a small clearing. To the right was a block fence about the same height as a person, and to the left, an old looking apartment building. Maybe I was just imagining things, but the air there suddenly felt colder. The building was two stories high, with a staircase outside. The staircase seemed to be falling apart, with only the steel frame left that was rusted and covered in peeled paint. But what caught my eye most of all was a rather large window on the first floor that had a talisman attached to it. I didn't get too close, so I couldn't be sure, but it looked like there was something written on it, and the bottom had been torn off. Somebody go check it out, somebody said. I'll go, Enko replied, and went straight over. She approached the window without hesitation, and then, when she stood before it, she put her hands against the glass and looked inside. Wah! She suddenly screamed and came running back. We all jumped in surprise and then followed her back down the narrow road to the main street. We were so scared that once we reached the main road, we noticed that Kaikun had actually wet himself, and we all made fun of him. I think it was something we did to hide our fear. That seemed to be the tacit understanding of the situation. Nothing happened after that. The summer holidays ended, and then it was back to school. But then Eskun fell from the second floor of his house and broke his leg. He didn't have to stay in the hospital, but he did come to school with crutches and was showered with attention for it. Then, a few days after that, Okun ran into someone during PE class and suffered a detached retina. He also had to go to the hospital, but he didn't lose his vision. His eyesight was impaired, but he could still see. We went to visit him that same Sunday, and... Okun joked that we had to be cursed because two people in a row who happened to visit that apartment had gotten injured. But after that, Kei Kun's dead body was found on the beach. There was no note, and a nearby security camera caught him entering the beach alone, so it was chalked up to an unfortunate accident and nothing more. At this point, everyone was starting to think that Maybe we really were cursed, and perhaps we should take part in a purification ritual or something. Nah, I think we'll be okay now, Enko replied. She went on to say that she actually used to live in that same apartment building, and the story of the family who died there was just that, a story. That torn piece of paper that looked like a talisman was actually a sticker from some sweets that were popular when we were kids. When she ran screaming, she was just playing a joke to scare us. When she later told this to Keikun, who was so scared at the time that he wet his pants, he apparently threatened revenge. I'll curse you all. Everyone who laughed at me. I'll curse you all. According to Enko, both Eskun and Okun's injuries were because Keikun had tried to curse them, but because he failed, he then died. Maybe we were still scared and trying to make sense of it all, but we all agreed that, yeah, that had to be it. On our next day off, I went to see Okun and tell him everything, but he said that was crazy. He had been in the same class as Enko ever since elementary school, but apparently she transferred to his school in the second grade. They ended up moving out of that old apartment because it was in such bad condition that they were going to tear it down, meaning that her family were the last ones to live there. But what made the story crazy, according to Okun, 
was that the building was supposed to have been destroyed when they were in the second grade. So why was it still standing now when we were all in the third grade of junior high? In the end, that building was still standing when I graduated from high school, and even when I moved to a different city for work. I went back to see my parents every once in a while, but I never went out of my way to see if that building was still there, and now they've moved to a different city, so I have no idea what's going on with it. I don't know if the two who got injured really were injured because of Keikun's curse. Maybe something really did happen at that building, but because Enko was so young at the time, nobody ever told her about it. The whole thing just doesn't sit right with me, so I guess I wanted to see what others thought of it. Oh, and after Keikun's death, nothing happened to any of us ever again. I did do a bit of my own research after all that, and apparently when we were in the first grade, there was an incident where not a whole family was killed, but rather a father killed his wife and child and then tried to take his own life, but the exact details of where that happened weren't written. Finally this week, a young man loses his mother, but it seems he may not have seen the last of her yet. Find out why in Mother. My mother died. She was a kind person. She greeted everyone with a smile, endured violence from my late father, and was the rope that held our family together. That mother of mine died. As she got older, she started to spout more abusive language, and because we weren't in an environment to get care for her, in the end, I had to admit her to a hospital. I had few relatives I could rely on, and I was still single as well, so I had no time to grieve for my mother. I was too busy with my role as principal mourner and organising her funeral. Relatives I didn't even know gathered bit by bit at the funeral and lit incense. The monk chanted next to me, and finally I was able to stop and catch my breath. Ever since she'd gotten older, my mother had given me nothing but trouble, but now that she was dead, all I could remember was the young, kind mother of my youth. Feeling myself about to cry, I turned to the coffin in front of me and stared at my mother's dead face. Suddenly. A white mist appeared out of her closed mouth. It was thin as smoke, but rather than disappearing, it seemed to get sucked up into the ceiling. Stunned, I looked around at everyone in attendance. But everyone was looking at the ground, and the monk in front of me had his eyes closed as he chanted as well. Am I the only one who saw that? I thought. Nobody else did. What the hell was that? I waited, but still nobody else looked up. For some reason, it was a frightening sight. Excuse me, I muttered, standing up from my seat. I made my way towards the stairs heading up to the room directly above us. I didn't imagine that mist. I was sure of it, and when I arrived on the second floor, the sliding door to the room at the end the room directly above my mother's coffin, was open. Inside was pitch black. The room was unused, and thus kept as a storage room, but for some reason a fresh breeze was blowing through it. I looked down at the floor. There were no stains of any kind. I continued staring at it, and then I felt a sudden pulling sensation. Crap! I was in danger! Shin-chan? What are you doing? Are you okay? A loud voice called out to me, snapping me out of it. Seemed some of my relatives found it odd that I left and came to see what I was doing. Ah, yeah, I'm fine. I'll be back in a minute. I looked around the room once more, almost glaring at it, and then violently closed the sliding door. Hey... 
What's wrong? Are you really okay? My mother took my hand next to me and we walked over to the stairs together. Yeah, it's nothing. I just saw something strange, I said. Strange? Like what? Something scary? But we're at a funeral. You can't say silly things like that. Yeah, yeah, Mum. You're always... I stopped in my tracks. My mother was dead. This was her funeral. My mother was dead. Dead. When I looked over, my mother was staring at me. She was wearing her white patient's clothes, just like when she died. I was so terrified that I couldn't speak. My mouth hung wide open, and I clung to the wall like a child. Shin-chan, answer me when I'm talking to you. It took everything I had to just keep breathing, so I wasn't able to say a word. You always used to be such a good boy. When did you change? She stuck her tongue out at me like a child and tilted her head. That gesture was so horrifying that I forgot to breathe. With her tongue still hanging out and her head swinging like a pendulum, she approached me. I screamed. It was a small scream that soon disappeared into the darkness of the hall. My mother's face was right in front of mine. Her breath, smelling like that of an old man, pierced my nostrils, and her tongue, horrifyingly long, slowly reached out for me as she gnashed her teeth. Blood dripped from her mouth, leaving a red stain on the floor. She continued biting her own tongue and lashing out with it over and over again. I could feel myself on the verge of fainting, and still no words came out. My mouth just hung open. Next thing I knew, it seemed her tongue was sucking the life force out of me or something. It hurt. It was like she was eating me. Just before I passed out, I looked into her eyes and there I saw nothing but darkness. My relatives forced me to go to a mental hospital and I didn't resist. I wanted time to think and I knew that I could leave whenever I wanted to as well. It seemed these people would take anyone, as long as you paid them. Even someone who looked as exhausted as me. Or even someone as meddlesome as my mother. A massive thank you and shout out to this week's Kami Tier members, Christina, Giovanni and Estash. It's thanks to your support, along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show, so thank you very much. Don't forget to check out Toshiden Theatre, Bite-Sized Japanese Urban Legends Volume 1, out on Amazon right now. And check out our newly revamped merchandise store at kowabana.store. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Kowabana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on kowabana.net. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin for exclusive bonus stories and extras, or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Japan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks guys, stay safe, and I'll see you again next time for even more Kowabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to kowabana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koabana.net now.